Hope you are seeing my there we go. screen. We're all set. We can You've see got the it? screen and audio established. So please proceed with your presentation. Thank you very much, Bob. Okay. Well, welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to meet you and to visit your country long distance uh, for the very first time. I have heard a lot about the uh, uh, activities uh, in Saudi Arabia and uh, I want to mostly try in 40 minutes to give you an overview of this very powerful methodology that is working throughout the world to drive innovation, not just in startups, but by many established companies as well. So very briefly, uh, not quite, but almost 50 years ago, I started my first company at the ripe old age of 22, started a total of seven companies, uh, two of which were quite successful, two modestly successful, and three where you really learn how to build a business. Uh, the ones where you invest a pile of your own money, years of your sweat and blood, and wind up basically with nothing. Uh, and that's when you stop and you say, how do you really drive innovation? How do you build a business, whether it's inside a large established company like many of yours or in three young men or women in a garage someplace starting to build a software company. Um, after starting my own companies, I spent about a decade investing in 27 different startups and working closely with them. Seven more, seven of those 27 were went public and six more of them went DTT, which is my personal acronym for direct into the toilet. I uh, used all of that experience, plus having worked in the launch of Steve Blank's uh, $8 billion IPO, a software company called Epiphany, um, based on our working together, launching his business for several years, he invited me to join him to write the Startup Owner's Manual that has proven to be not only a guide for startups, but a guide for driving innovation in large established companies like the those uh, run by many of you. Some of the companies I've worked with, as were mentioned, GE, Merck, News Corp, Carvajal, and many others, uh, large established companies trying to adapt this methodology to drive truly disruptive innovation inside their own companies. And uh, spent five of the last six years teaching the methodology at, uh, at Columbia Business School as well. So let's get started, right? This concept known often as lean innovation or customer development, it works very, very well. It works more easily at startups because startups have nothing to lose. As we say here, they're betting the farm. They have an incredibly high risk tolerance, no legacy to worry about, no history to worry about. Very few of them have children or mortgages, so they have no income to worry about. And that gives them an unlimited risk tolerance unlike the way most large corporations, uh, which are typically risk averse, uh, tend to operate. And more and more big companies are adapting parts of this methodology to get to the heart of the issue. And that is whether you're starting a new line of business or a new division of an old established billion dollar company or three kids in a garage, either way, the best ideas die, not because you can't build the product, but because you can't find the customers. You can find the first few almost any time, but getting from there to a repeatable, scalable, profitable business is a challenge for companies large or small. And the fundamental premise of the customer development or lean startup methodology, and they're synonymous, is that the business plan is not a useful tool any longer. For a hundred years, startups and internal startups thought that the first step was to sit in a closed room and write a 50, 60 
stage business plan and that all you needed to do to be successful was to execute the plan which you wrote with no external or minimal external influence with very little feedback from the only people who matter your customers and so the new way customer development focuses on how to procedurally go out and solicit customer feedback about every element of the business and to test every element of the business from the product itself to its benefits its pricing and much much more one piece at a time while you are actually building the business so that when the software or the hardware or the plumbing is ready for sale you understand who wants to buy it where they want to find it where they want to purchase it uh, what they're willing to pay for it and their relative enthusiasm and as as has been said really already this method has truly taken the world by storm over the last 12 years Steve Blank began teaching it at Stanford and Berkeley. He and I both have taught it at Columbia. I've taught it at Skokovo nine times in Russia and uh, 4,000 other um, universities, no, I'm sorry, four, that's a typo. 400 universities around the world are now teaching this methodology as are American government institutions like the National Science Foundation the National Institute of Health, the Small Business Administration, and others. And a number of governments uh, have adopted it, and major corporations are increasingly adopting it as well. There are five sort of fundamental principles of this different method. Startups, whether they're inside a big business or inside a small garage, are not just smaller versions of a big company. A big company has customers, it has products, it has history, it has competitors, and it's dealing with lots of knowns. But on a first day of a new venture's life, it has no history, it has no product, it has no customers. And so the challenge is to figure all of that out before you get your first customer. Since after all, when you write that 50 page business plan, customers don't realize or acknowledge all the wisdom that you spent months putting into that business plan. They don't read them, they don't know how they're supposed to react. And so the plan is a benign document that belongs in a library, a static sort of corner of the world and not an active document that drives the growth of a successful business. And the way you drive that growth in a startup or a big business is by operating your business, not in execute mode, right? Big companies are known for execution, for their ability to write a plan based on facts and history and to execute that plan. New ventures, have no history to build their plan around. And so they begin life in what we've come to call search mode. Let me search for the customers. Let me search for the values and the product features that are going to excite them and get them to buy. And let me first test all of the elements of my business before I begin to spend the serious money actually executing on that plan. Principle number four, the only place to get that kind of feedback is to get out, to get out of the office, get out of the building and get face to face with the customers to understand their attitudes, what they like, what they don't like, what excites them, what will get them to spend money with your company. So step one in implementing this process is to abandon the business plan document entirely. Typically it will take two months to write a good business plan and all the spreadsheets and forecasts that are appended to it. 
almost all of which are truly guesses. They're your guesses as to, I think this is going to work, my experience tells me that, but they're not facts. So let's take a couple of minutes and talk about what a business model is. Here's a simple cartoon illustration. The simplest way to think about a business model is that you can put on a single sheet of paper, roughly A4 size or nine by eight and a half by 11 size, all of the key elements that make this business successful. And if you look right in the center at number one, the value proposition, um, most entrepreneurs, most corporate intrapreneurs think that the business is almost totally about the product, the value proposition. What is it? What are its features, advantages, and benefits? And they forget all the other elements of the plan. And I want to walk through just a few of these to give you <coughs> a sense of what goes on to this more, you know, theoretically single sheet of paper talking about its value proposition. So the heart of the value proposition is, of course, the product. What are its features? What are its advantages? What are its benefits? How does it do what it does? Is it software, hardware, technology of some other sort? So that's part one. Part two, how does it fit in the universe? Who are its competitors? What makes the competitor weaker than your product or service? Um, and how are you going to compete with which of those competition? Also, what is the market size of the business? Is it a potentially a huge business opportunity or a small business opportunity? So it's basically framing the business itself, and that's right sort of in the heart of the, of the document. Number two, the customer segment. Who is the customer? Why or is he or she going to buy the product from you? Uh, what motive, you know, what helps you define that customer target as precisely and narrowly as humanly possible in order to allow you to focus your customer development activity, your marketing activity, your sales team on the customer, him or herself. And the way we think about this is tell me who the 20 customers are who are most likely to be very excited, challenged, interested in this product and to design your product to excite them and to solicit feedback from people who look like them so that you know you can grow from that core base. Because if you can't get it right for 20, it's very hard to know how to get it right for 200 or 2,000 or the 20,000 customers you may ultimately want to serve. And one way to think about this is to use this initial thinking to develop a customer archetype, literally almost a cartoon like the one on the bottom of your screen of what does my customer look like? How old are they? What's their job title? Do they work at a large corporation or a small corporation? Do they manage this function or execute the function? Or are they way high up in the organization chart at the company? Again, to be able to make them as precisely identifiable as you can along the way. Box number four, customer relationships. How are you going to get those customers? What marketing tactics and techniques are you going to use? Are you going to go to trade shows or have a direct sales force or sell it only online or let Apple sell it in the app store? How are you going to get the customers? Once you get them, how are you going to keep them with retention programs, with customer support? starting, of course, with an excellent product. And if you can keep them, then how are you going to grow those customers over time? Two very different ways. First, 
by selling them more, more frequently, more different products, products from others. What can you do to expand that relationship? And if you have enthusiastic, positive customers, they're susceptible to those kinds of programs, whether they're incentive programs or frequent flyer or points programs or things like that. And the second way to get to grow your customer universe is to use the customers who are happy and satisfied as your viral marketing agents, referring you to their friends and coworkers and colleagues and people at other companies by encouraging, incentivizing them to promote your product or service uh, to their friends. So coming back to the sort of full canvas, there are some other boxes, other elements I don't want to spend too much time on. The one on the lower right is obviously critical. If I do this and I do it successfully, about how many customers do I think I'm going to have? How are they going to pay me? And uh, how often are they going to pay me? Are they renting my software or buying it? Are they try, you know, trying something that's a free version and I have to convert them to get them to pay? Um, all of the considerations on the revenue side and across on the lower left, Similarly, what are the unit costs essentially of each of my transactions and what kinds of corporate or overhead or sales costs get laid against that revenue in order to get a very rough hewn comp, you know, computation of my potential profit. Some of the others, what resources do I need? Do I need iron ore or oil or sand or, you know, bandwidth or uh, lots of talented software developers? What activities do I have to undertake? Do I have to build something? Do I have to show up at the customer's location and deliver it? Uh, do I have a complex manufacturing process that I need to manage very closely? And last, what partners are there distribution partners, promotional partners, uh, companies that are key service providers like uh, outsourced manufacturing partners, things like that, that I need. So you basically, when you finish this document, you have all of the ideas about all of the elements of your business, not simply what is the product and what is the price, which is where too many innovators start their thinking. But once you've completed the canvas, what you really have is a bunch of hypotheses. And your canvas, if you're honest with yourself, looks like this, right? I have a bunch of guesses. Now, when you're an established business, it's clearly not all guesswork. You want to be identifying the weakest elements in your canvas as they relate to your old business. You want to optimize those links. Where possible, you want to use the canvas to look at established, existing corporate resources that you can use to drive this new business. If you have a huge warehouse for another division of your company, wouldn't you much prefer to use a corner of that warehouse till you see how well this business really does than to go and rent another one? If your company operates a fleet of trucks, can you be your own delivery service? So it's identifying the resources that exist inside the large corporation that you can harness to launch the new sort of internal venture. And the other thing that Canvas helps you do is analyze your competition and make sure that as you evolve your thinking about your business model, you are aware of competitive influences, market influences, and designing a business that will cope with all of those. Some established businesses use this planning process to put new energy into an old line of business that has sort of slowed down, not in growth mode. Others use it to find new opportunities in 
existing old assets, and I'll give you an example of that in a little while. Third, to analyze the business models of competitors and probe for strengths or weaknesses and see where that creates opportunities for your own company. And last, it's a great tool for looking at your business as it is today and filling out a canvas for the business that you've been in your family for generations that hasn't been growing for a number of years. And to look at all of the elements of the canvas and challenge each one of them, first with your internal teams, and then by getting out and talking to your customers and understanding from them whether they would be responsive to a new way to do business. And so we get now to the heart of the methodology, customer discovery, right? This is when you take the business canvas tool and you begin to actually get out of the building and start to in interact with customers in customer discovery. And there are typically three phases to the customer discovery process. And the first of those has nothing to do with the product or service at all. The first of these is what we call problem discovery. Before you would want to launch a business, don't you want to be sure that there's a market opportunity you're playing into? And so the first phase is really a matter of understanding how serious the problem you're solving might be or how big the need might be. And the way to think about this is if you're not solving a painful, expensive, serious, urgent problem, you're probably not building a product for which there's a market, right? Businesses buy products and services because they solve problems. And the more serious and costly and painful that problem is, the more likely it is you've discovered a business opportunity. So in the first phase of customer discovery, you get out of the building and you don't talk about your product at all. You talk to customers about, do they have a problem with their accounts receivables management, let's say? Um, how big a problem is it? Well, the CEO stops by my office every morning when he starts his day and wants to know how we did collecting yesterday. So every night I wake up two or three times wondering about whether my number is gonna be good enough tomorrow and whether the CEO was happy with the number I delivered yesterday. It's a continuous high pressure, sometimes career risk problem. Those are the kinds of problems that big successful businesses are made of. Selling to consumers, very often you're not solving problems, you're filling a need, whether that need is to lose weight or to improve my health or to improve my love life. Um, is that need a top priority for the customer? How urgent is it? How often is it a problem for them? Understanding the dimensions of the market opportunity you're considering entering is step one, right? I've worked in Russia, I think 15 times. And in Russia, the typical attitude is I am a top Russian engineer. I graduated first in my class with honors from Moscow State University. I have 11 patents and I've got six trademarks and I know what the customer needs and I will build it and they will buy it. And if you are, can execute on that very egocentric uh, approach, um, you may actually have a business opportunity, but it really reads to me and to most of the business world like a fairy tale. Where is your proof of concept? Where is your demonstration of customer enthusiasm? How do you know they're going to care? How do you know they're going to buy it? 
And so spending a few days a week, sometimes more, talking to people you believe are good candidates to be your customers um, is a great way to get a closer understanding of an existing business or to explore the opportunities for a new one. If you have found that there is real enthusiasm, then you go on to step two. And to be honest, most companies don't get step one right the first time. They come back with mixed messages, with uh, sort of uncertain or garbled data. You're not looking for 100% enthusiasm. That would be preposterous. In fact, I've only seen it one time uh, where everybody they talked to wanted to buy the service right now. And it was in the warehouse automation space in Latin America, where that was a new sort of arena for mid-sized uh, warehouse distribution companies. And they just wanted to absolutely wanted to do it. They knew it was a problem. They didn't know how to deal with it. And when they heard that somebody in Colombia, the country, was ready to do it for them, they were very excited. But either way, if you have found this kind of excitement and demonstrated interest in purchasing, you're probably not the first one. So step two in the process is to take a walk in the customer's shoes, to go to Google, to go to retail stores, to go to Amazon and other e-commerce players in your own region and understand what the competitive universe looks like, which ones seem to be or can be documented to be selling well or badly, uh, which ones seem to be most exciting to customers, which companies seem most successful, most established, so that you can begin to build a sort of competitive model or matrix uh, that tells you where your company fits in the universe, which competitors you have to worry about, which ones you can ignore. Very often you will change the product or the marketing or the positioning based on this learning and then and only then is it time to go out and start to talk to customers about whether they like your product concept itself because up to now you couldn't explain why it was better than oracle not as good as sap far better than hewlett packard half the price of ibm um and now you can finally present not only the problem, but the solution and the solution's uniqueness or point of difference in a competitive market of existing solutions, which you are likely to find whether you are the largest company in the world or a uh, very small startup. But at this point in step three, with that in your sort of pocket, you uh, go out and start to show the product itself in the roughest, quickest prototype you can muster. Show them the product and get an honest sense sitting across the table from them. Are they excited about it? Do they want to, you know, I, I know this is a buggy prototype, but I will, I, I want it right now. This problem is so serious in my company that I'd rather have an imperfect solution then no solution at all. So you're looking for high levels of enthusiasm, not 100%, but not 5%, right? You need to see a consistent pattern of when I show customers who I believe are in my customer segment, when I show them my product or my value proposition, I have a persistent, consistent acceptance or enthusiasm rate. Three out of 10 of the people I show it to are jumping up and down, eager to buy it, right? If you are selling something like software, typically you'll be able to um, have a profitable business making three or four sales of enterprise software 
for every 10 sales calls you go out on. So you go down to the bottom boxes of the canvas and you rough out the costs of making 10 sales calls. And if three sales per 10 calls allows you to have a profitable business, you keep going. If not, you've got to come back, change the cost structure, change the product, change the marketing approach, change the salespeople, change the way you present it or position it. And then you go back and you do it again. And very often this is done four, five, six cycles uh, until you are certain you've got the best possible match between a customer who looks like they should want your product and their willingness to buy. And if you're selling Lear jets or Gulfstream jets, you can live with one sale per 250 sales calls because the gross margin on a good Gulfstream jet is, you know, 10 or $12 million. You can pay a lot of salespeople and buy a lot of rental cars for those salespeople in order to sell one Gulfstream. If you're selling apps for the app store, you can't spend very much, if any, money at all. And so understanding that equation and testing your way to a valid sort of profitable version of that equation uh, is something that should be done well before the product is ready to launch so that you know exactly what you're going to do to launch, where you're going to find the customers, what they look like, what publications they read or trade shows they attend, things like that. And to do this quickly, you start with some uh, rough and dirty prototype version of the product, enough to give them an experience, a sense of what the product actually is or does, to give them something to react to more substantial than a sales pitch. And you use that in your customer discovery to elicit their feedback, get their coaching on what they like and what they don't like. As you try to get to what we talk about as product market fit, I know who the customer is, they're in love with our minimum viable product, and they know that there's more of the product to come and that the finished version will be a quality product because it's coming from our major company, but they have demonstrated clear signs of enthusiasm to buy. And when this doesn't happen, which is often, you pivot, you go back a step and you iterate the product, you iterate the marketing, you iterate the, va the, the value proposition or the way you present the value proposition as quickly and with as much agility as you can. And you're testing, improving, doing an experiment, and getting some feedback, iterating based on the learning and doing it again and again. Let me give you three very quick examples. Probably the most legendary was IBM. Frank Carey, then the CEO of IBM in 1980, said we need to be in the PC business, right? So he knew that if he put this through the normal product development cycle at IBM, he would be in the PC business somewhere around 2017 instead of 1981. So he put together a team of 12 people with a very senior leader, very trusted to him, and said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to move a thousand miles away from IBM headquarters so we don't even know you exist. I want you to break any rule you need to break to get this done, but I want to be a major factor in the PC business as quickly as humanly possible. And so based on that, lack of rules and keeping it outside of the normal IBM development framework, they were able to introduce the IBM PC one year later uh, and get it to sales of $1 billion two years from the day Project Chess was launched. 
Now, obviously, that only served them well for about 25 years till they wound up selling the PC business off. But I think that is sort of part of the normal life cycle of business. But look at the rules IBM agreed to break to make this happen inside one of the largest corporations in the world. Rule number one, you don't just need to use parts made by IBM in an IBM product. That was heresy. That was really absolutely forbidden at IBM from its founding as a meat slicer company some years before. Number two, right? It allowed them to buy disk drives and components from Asia that were already existing, that could be customized quickly, manufactured quickly to IBM quality tolerances. The same with software. This was a rule that a guy named Bill Gates was particularly happy about. The software does not have to be developed and coded by IBM employees. And number three, it doesn't have to, an IBM product for the very first time no longer needs to be sold by an IBM salesperson. This was a legendary breakthrough in the process and the results sort of speak for themselves. I had the pleasure of working for about a year with the Energy Storage Solutions Division of General Electric, a brand new division started inside a hundred plus year old Fortune 50 company founded by the great Thomas Edison more than a century ago. Jeff Immelt, the recently retired CEO, wanted to drive the company into clean technology. They had a designated a factory building to be used. They gutted it down to a dirt floor because they didn't know what they were going to build. They bought a prototype. They bought some technology, but they didn't know what exactly they were going to do other than get into the energy storage business. So we, they, hired Steve Blank and myself to work with them to understand who would want to buy this, why they would want to buy it, what the product needed to look like, feel like, function like, and so forth. And we spent months doing customer discovery, flying literally around the world, not to read a report on battery usage in freezers, but to go spend a day walking around a giant um, frozen food warehouse the size of six football fields outside of Chicago's O'Hare Airport to understand how batteries were used in the forklift trucks turned out to be a huge market because the batteries in forklift trucks are like the batteries in your automobile and they degrade and stop working in about 40 minutes, causing the forklift driver to have to go and change the batteries and so forth. One of the performance characteristics of GE's new battery was that it worked at full performance regardless of the temperatures. A second market was the other extreme of temperature cell phone towers in areas where the remote areas where the grid was unreliable and the cell phone towers were constantly running out of uh, electricity. This was for the backup system for those, or sometimes, as we learned, better as a backup system for the uh, diesel fuel generator that was the first line of defense. Based on the learning and the feedback from customers about what they wanted, what they didn't want, um, the plant that was built over the two years during the customer discovery process literally was sold out from the day they actually pushed the print button. Uh, and revenue bookings in 2013 exceeded $80 million. In 2011, Revenue bookings were zero. So one of the sort of knocks or complaints about this lean startup methodology is that it's, uh, you know, it only makes small businesses. This is a good example of uh, 
one that builds large businesses. At Carvajal, and I know I'm racing the clock here a little bit, so forgive me, we started 12 parallel internal startup teams taking top leadership out of their current lines of business and making them captains of teams where each team member had to spend 25 hours a week working on a new business model generated inside the company in a series of workshops with Alex Osterwalder and friends. We then took over and began the customer discovery process to see if those um, business models made any sense at all and if there were business opportunities. The teams were given the freedom to break rules. We knew that 12 of the 12 um, startups we were building were not all going to succeed, but we were seeking new lines of revenue from the business. So out of the 12, we had three very successful businesses. The one that I'd just like to mention <clears throat> was a new type of a replacement, if you will, for styrofoam, one of the great uh, causes of uh, excessive waste and landfill uh, consumption throughout the world by taking several unused or underutilized paper mills and instead of putting wood pulp into the soup in the paper mill, we put in sugarcane refuse. The gas is, or the leaves that are cut off the sugarcane before it's harvested or while it's harvested. And that bagasse, when turned into paper, could be made waterproof or water resistant and grease resistant with a very slight dose of plastic coating, so slight that the cup itself was completely biodegradable and uh, could replace styrofoam with something that never saw the inside of a dump. So um, that business has gone on to be quite successful in a number of uh, different markets, particularly disposable coffee cups and the clamshells that hamburgers and french fries typically go into in uh, fast food restaurants. So two quick minutes, the key challenges at big companies and how you drive innovation there. There are basically four challenges at big companies. Factor one is process. Big companies operate on plans. We execute the plans and punish the people who don't execute them. We have rules, we have procedures. And when we want to do something new or innovative, we call Bain or McKinsey or BCG. We don't do that ourselves, or we send it over to the market research department, but we don't know how to drive innovation internally. So what do you do about that? Change the process to build team internal teams that are operating like startups business within the much larger business. Find examples in your own industry of companies that have done it successfully. Identify and insulate a startup team inside the business so they have the freedom to break some rules, so they have the freedom to move without meetings and lawyers and HR and all this process to go and make it happen. And when they find a problem, that saves the company a lot of money or fixes a bad idea and makes it stronger, celebrate those victories along the way. Factor number two, the people who work in big companies typically work there because they like the security and the certainty and the predictability of their job. Make serving on one of these innovation teams an honor. Celebrate these courageous people. Find rock stars within your own company and assure them that they're, if they do a good, hard job at this, uh, their career is certainly protected. Uh, give them flexibility. They're going to work really hard. Can they work from home? Can they wear jeans to that building down the road on the corporate campus, uh, promise them growth opportunities 
that equate to the stock options that young startup founders get, whether it's career capital, the opportunity to be exposed to leadership more often, the opportunity to pursue some of your own ideas, and be as excited about ideas that don't work out as you are about ideas that do work out, because when an idea doesn't work out, it saves the company tons of money, tons of you know cycles and stress and resources, and also the risk of embarrassment in the marketplace and so forth. Priorities. If this type of disruptive innovation is not a priority for the CEO or the division head, sometimes uh, in your region of the world, it's the bright young son of the founder who wants to shake things up and drive new disruptive growth in the company. Somebody who says, yes, our priority is to make the quarterly numbers, but we need to make the quarterly numbers five years from now, and we need new products, new business lines that will help us do that. And other people will say, gee, these businesses start small. Well, so did Aramco, so did Coca-Cola, so did IBM. It has to start small, and if you don't want to call the merchant banker and acquire the company, you need to grow them from the inside. So you need that leadership buy-in. You need to somehow isolate these crazy pioneers that are trying to break some rules and do something bold and dramatic. You need to somehow segregate them, if you will, put them in a different building, free them from the meetings and the email and the normal constraints that people who work in large companies uh, deal with it, give them permission to break the rules, and a senior executive with the authority and the credibility and the clout to defend them when they step on a toe or a landmine or whatever. And the last factor is paranoia, right? Companies are afraid to show products that are under development to customers because they're worried it might be embarrassing. But if you are inviting a customer to give you feedback because they are knowledgeable or smart or loyal, it's more of a compliment than it is a risk to the company. So you need to deal with this fear of, oh, this is never going to work or this is going to put our company at risk by finding measurable progress benchmarks along the way. The team leader has to be totally candid with his sponsor to be sure that there are no surprises. There needs to be a clear week by week written work plan, and there needs to be the courage to just go out and do it. So that was about a two hour lecture. I am glad to have completed it in I think 41 minutes, and I uh, look forward to welcoming any questions you may have. Well, thank you very much, Bob. And uh, folks, we're now open for question and answers. If you have any questions, you could always insert it in the question box or you could equally raise your hand. There's a hand icon available on the console, so please click on it if you want to talk to Bob. Um, let me go to the question, Bob. Uh, do you help large companies apply the lean startup principles in their innovation efforts? Uh, yes, I spend a, a good deal of my time working hand-in-hand uh, -in -hand with companies as they try to create these teams, train the teams in the methodology, coach them as they proceed through the exploration, um, and try, you know, to treat the teams with the... the be uh, sort of proper respect and uh, not be their uh, babysitter, so to speak, but instead, you know, uh, for example, in Latin America with Carvajal, a billion dollar company, spend a week with the teams, both in workshops and one on one team by team. And then by Friday or Thursday, every team had its work plan for the next two weeks. 
and we would connect by Skype or whatever, but they would really drive the innovation because they need to own it. They need to uh, really take charge and drive the bus. All right. Thank you very much. Um, another one. What are the first steps you encourage an established company to take? I think the very first step is to really get a good grounding in the methodology, where it's worked successfully and where it hasn't, and see if the leadership team of the company, of the parent company to these new startups, is seriously committed to taking the, the risk and to testing the method. Because if the senior team isn't committed, then it, it, it's almost certain that the innovation program is going to be a failure. At Merck, for example, in the $3 billion consumer product division of Merck, the CEO said, let's create our own venture board. And she brought four or five of her direct reports onto what looks just like a board of directors. And once a month, each of the startup teams at Merck and to come in and present its progress to the venture board. And the venture board would decide whether to tell them to keep going or to you know, give them feedback and make some changes. Or in one case, they shut it down when, they just, when the team discovered that there was really no profit margin opportunity in the consumer vitamin business because more than half of all vitamins sold in the United States are sold at a deep discount, which means the, you know, the profits of the manufacturer are basically given back to retailers in the process. So step one is making sure that management is committed to this process and approach. And then step two, which is almost as critical, can you find the courageous, sort of highly entrepreneurial leadership to participate in and drive these teams inside a large corporation where they sometimes often have other personal and corporate agendas. And, uh, and are they really willing to take the risk, to commit the energy, to dedicate themselves relentlessly to this? And, uh, you know, those are the two sort of first challenges. Uh, sometimes even before you think about what is the idea they're going to prosecute along the way. Thank you very much. Uh, another one. In your view, what is the most common factor that demoralizes or demotivates entrepreneurs? Uh, well, I I think it's really a uh, persistent uh, struggle or failure in, on the road to this um, sort of step I talked about called product market fit, right? If you look at the statistics, there are so many statistics about startup failure or entrepreneurial failure that put it in the, you know, 90 to somewhere between 90 and 98% of all businesses that are started today will fail to scale into sizable material businesses. And so there is this uh, big chasm often known as the land of the walking dead, where a company is sort of poking along with either a little bit of revenue or uh, a little or a more revenue, but no profitability. But in either case, they are not seeing any growth. And I think that when you fail to see uh, growth in an early stage company, whether it's an internal company or a new independent startup, that's by far the most uh, disorienting, uh, depressing. Uh, issue for the people on the team and usually they solve that problem by leaving the organization which is a you know is a shame 
but it's a because they will know long before the senior management will know that things aren't going well because they are the ones who are face to face with the customers out in the field seeing polite enthusiasm not genuine and you know high level enthusiasm things like that all right thank you very much bob that really brings us towards the end of the webinar any quick concluding remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss out I would just say that this, uh, when you read, if you spend some time, read the Harvard Business Review article on the lean startup and its increasing adoption and power in major corporations, it takes a great deal of courage to launch this kind of an initiative in an established, sizable company, but the opportunities are there to create new disruptive lines of business inside old companies. And if I can be of help to any of your many old historic successful companies, Bob Dorf at Gmail, pretty easy to find. So thank you all for your attention and uh, enjoyed being with you this, this evening. Well, equally, we all enjoyed it. So thank you very much, Bob, for taking the time to deliver this webinar on Miles' platform. So I really want to thank you on behalf of the Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship for your valuable information that you shared with all of us. So thank you very much once again. And thank you all of those who participated in this webinar. We are recording. So please stay tuned to webinar.org. With that note, I would like to end and conclude. So you all have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're calling from. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.